This mini lecture is focused on how to generate Michaelis Minton graphs, such as the one in the right hand panel. Michaelis Minton graphs are used to extract kinetic parameters such as Km, Kcat, and catalytic efficiency. It was developed by Maud Minton on the left and Leonor Michaelis on the right. The first step is to calculate the optimal protein concentration required for the assay. For this, we use progress curves. Progress curve is a graph of an observable's change over time. In enzyme kinetics, a progress curve is used to determine the optimal concentration of enzyme for an assay, to determine the saturation conditions of a substrate or cofactor, and sometimes used to demonstrate inhibition. This graph shows a typical progress curve in which the line represents product forming over time. We would only use or are interested in initial rates in which we are looking for a linear progress curve. Here is a progress curve that one might expect as changing enzyme concentration and monitoring product over time. At the lower enzyme concentrations, the graph of product over time is linear. and as the enzyme increases, a plateau is observed earlier and earlier in the time course. The reason you do this progress curve is, in, is to optimize the data that you acquired for all of your experiments to generate the michaelis menten curve. You want to choose a concentration in which, one, the data is linear for approximately 60 seconds. For some of you, it may be 40. For others, you may be able to do 90 seconds. And two, in which you're using the lowest concentration, such that you don't waste enzyme, for which the change over the 60 seconds is significant. What is significant? You would like at least approximately 0.1 absorbance unit change over the 60 seconds. If you have more than one absorbance change over the 60 seconds, then you are challenging the linear region of the spectrophotometer. Your change in absorbance should be less than 1 and above 0.1. Once you've determined the optimal protein concentration to be used for the assay, calculate the concentration volumes you want for each point on the michaelis menten curve. You need to set up an organized table. You want all reagent concentrations to remain constant except substrate concentration. You should estimate the Km of the enzyme based on literature and design the number of reactions set that, such that you have substrate concentrations between 0.2 and 5 times the Km. Typically you should use 8 or more substrate concentrations. Be sure to have cofactors and other substrates in saturating conditions. Once you have made your table and have calculated all the concentrations and volumes of all the solutions that you will use, go ahead and mix the solutions outlined in the table for each reaction. Add your enzyme last and right before you record the initial velocities for each reaction. Immediately after adding your enzyme and mixing your solution, place the cuvette into the spectrophotometer and record absorbance over time. Once you have recorded your progress curve, you want to convert your absorbance units to product concentration. Your initial progress curve is absorbance versus time. You need to use Beer's Law to convert absorbance to product concentration. This is easily done with graphing software and does not to need to be done manually. Beer's Law states that absorbance equals the extinction coefficient times the path length L times the concentration of the solution. So to measure the concentration, you would divide the absorbance by the extinction coefficient and the pass length of the spectrophotometer. Be sure to know the pass length of your spectrophotometer, as well as the extinction coefficient and the molecule you are detecting at the wavelength that you are detecting it at. For each of your progress curves, if you have the absorbance versus time in your spreadsheet, you can use the formula to convert the absorbance in one column to the product concentration in another column. Once you've converted the absorbance units to product concentration, then use a graphing software such as Excel or Origin to fit the data to a line. Record the slope in your spreadsheet and repeat for all substrate concentrations. Here is a schematic of how this works. For each substrate concentration of your michaelis menten curve, as you will see S1, S2, and S3, for each point for those substrate concentrations on the michaelis menten curve, you have a progress curve in which you've converted the absorbance to product concentration on the y-axis and you've monitored this over time. You will select the linear region of this progress curve and fit to a line. You'll then take the slope, which is the initial velocity, and you will plot that on your michaelis menten curve for that substrate concentration. So for S1, you will see the initial velocity 1. 
You will continue to repeat this and process the data in this way for your entire michaelis menten curve. It is worth mentioning here that you want to ensure that you have points both above and below the KM so that in the linear region of the michaelis menten curve you would like to have more than three points and you would like to have several points defining saturation and you would like to have several points defining the curve aspect from the linear region to the saturation region. Once you've generated the michaelis menten curve, you could fit it with nonlinear regression methods using origin, which is why I would prefer to use origin. However, if you use Excel, you can use a less accurate method and transform the michaelis menten curve to a linear representation. Here are two linear plots that you could use. The line weaver burke on the left is the reciprocal of substrate versus the reciprocal of the velocity, in which the y-intercept is 1 over v max and the x-intercept is minus 1 over km. On the right is the haynes wolf plot, which is the substrate on the x-axis versus substrate over velocity on the y-axis, in which the x-intercept is minus km and the y-intercept is km over v max. I would prefer the use of Haynes Wolf over Lion Weaver Burke because the Haynes Wolf doesn't emphasize the higher concentrations as much as the Lion Weaver Burke, which can bias your data. During lab, you'll investigate an inhibitor of lactate dehydrogenase. There are many different types of inhibitors. The first class that you could divide inhibitors into are reversible inhibitors and irreversible inhibitors. There are many different types of reversible and irreversible inhibitors. Irreversible inhibitors tend to be covalently bound to the enzyme. There are several different types of inhibitors with different effects on the michaelis menten curves. Shown here is the graph of the michaelis menten curve for a specific enzyme with no inhibitor in blue and with a competitive inhibitor, an uncompetitive inhibitor, and a pure non-competitive inhibitor. By looking at the graph, you should be able to deduce whether the inhibitor affects Vmax KM or both. A competitive inhibitor only affects KM and not Vmax. By looking at the graph on the left and the schematic above it, you may be able to understand why a competitive inhibitor only affects KM. A competitive inhibitor only binds enzyme and can be competed off with substrate. So as you see in the schematic, E can bind substrate going to ES, E can bind inhibitor and go to EI, and EI can then have I displaced by S going to ES. KI is at the association constant of the inhibitor. In the graphs below the schematic, you see that the green lines are increasing concentrations of inhibitor given in factors of KI. So as you increase the inhibitor, you see that our KM is shifted towards the right at increasing substrate. So our KM is increasing with inhibitor. What may not be obvious is that the graphs will continue to reach the Vmax of no inhibitor at higher concentrations of substrate. So although the Vmax doesn't change, it takes more substrate to reach that Vmax. A pure non-competitive inhibitor binds to both enzyme and enzyme substrate complex and binds to a different region of the protein than the substrate does. Thus, the KM of the substrate doesn't change. It's not inter the inhibitor is not interacting with that region of the protein. Yet, it does inhibit the turnover of the enzyme and thus changes the Vmax. Mixed non-competitive inhibition is similar to pure non-competitive inhibition in that the inhibitor can bind to the enzyme or the enzyme substrate complex. Look at the schematic on the right in which you see E plus I going to EI and ES going to EIS. The inhibitor can bind to enzyme or enzyme substrate complex. However, mixed non-competitive inhibition, the inhibitor has a different affinity for each of the complexes, such that Ki for the enzyme is different than Ki from the enzyme substrate complex. They are not equal. The result of this in the michaelis menten kinetics is that both Vmax and Km change. The graph on the left is when the Ki for the inhibitor to the enzyme is less than the inhibitor to the enzyme substrate complex. The graph on the right is when the Ki for the enzyme substrate complex is less than that for the enzyme. Pure uncompetitive inhibition is when the inhibitor only binds to the enzyme substrate complex. When this occurs, both Km and Vmax change, 
but the ratio of Km to Vmax does not. Thus, in the line weaver brick plot, the data for inhibitor and without inhibitor have the same slope. Here's a summary of the competitive, non-competitive, and uncompetitive inhibitions in their reaction schematics. Stop the video here and make sure that you really understand why the Km and Vmax of each inhibitor changes. Don't just memorize when and where the Km and Vmax changes, but really stop and look at the schematics to understand why. Here are just a few practical tips that you should remember when you're in the lab performing the experiment. Make sure you label all your tubes clearly, and it's best to do this at the beginning of the lab. Mix all your reactions thoroughly but gently. This is a very common contributor to poor kinetics data. Do not hold your tube in your hand. It will warm up your solutions. Pipette precisely. Beware of cross-contamination between solutions. Be sure to turn on your spectrophotometer when you get into lab so that it can warm up. Also know the direction you should load your cuvette into the spectrophotometer. There are different models in the lab and you should really understand which one you're using and how it works. And be sure to use the right volume cuvette. The volume should fill at least 75% of the cuvette.